Good morning, everyone. Do you find yourself rambling on and on about nothing in particular? Does your head say, stop speaking now, but your mouth keeps going? <laughs> Is your idea of a good elevator speech asking someone what floor they're going to? Our speaker is a graduate of the University of Delaware with a communication degree in interpersonal and organizational communication. He is a prize-winning speaker, an award-winning author of four business books, and someone who once panicked when the CEO of his 300,000-person company ran on the treadmill next to him. We can all drone on and on, or can be the opposite and not share more than a hello. We can all learn to be clear, concise, and personable. When we can communicate, communicate effectively, we can increase sales, improve our position in a company, and more importantly, build strong relationships. Helping to show us how to improve our communication skills, and one who defines public speaking as any words coming out of your mouth, speaker, author, trainer, and wishful father of three teenage girls who gets excited when they talk to him instead of text. Let's welcome Tom Dowd <laughs> as he presents from Fear to Success, Lessons in Public Speaking. Thank you. Have you ever imagined your own funeral? Who will do the eulogy? Who will be your pallbearer? Who will attend? or even care. I attended my own funeral. Let me explain. But before I do, I need to disclose that no one died or was injured in the making of this speech. On a typical day where I was happily playing solitaire and checking out Facebook at work, I got the call. June 6th, the anniversary of Vienna. Not World War II. Displacement day. The day my 23-year job was eliminated. Just like that, it was all over. Hard work, tenure, and skills had nothing to do with this cost-cutting decision. I'm curious that my first thought wasn't to call my wife, but that I had to find a new Toastmasters club. On my ride to work on that fateful day, a news report announced 175,000 new jobs in the U.S., making the unemployment rate 7.6%. On my ride home, I was on the other side. One of the 11.7 million unemployed. To grasp the magnitude, take the entire population of New York City and add 4 million people. The call was like a shot to the head. I was being put to rest and people were preparing for my funeral. Condolences rolled in, hugs happened. Here's the How will people see you when you're gone? An old manager once asked if I ran through a wall, would people follow? At the time, I didn't know the answer. I needed to know the answer. That was a lifeline, a call to action. Fast forward six years later. I don't recall a more common day. A day of self-reflection, a chance to hover over my dead body and ask, was my life and career a success? The notes flooded in. Tom, you touched me. Personally and professionally, more than you'll ever know. Tom, we love you. This is your next speech. I ran through a wall, and people followed. But how was I going to tell my three daughters that Dad was being sent to the farm just like his childhood dog? The spending freeze <laughs> on shoes, clothes, and pizzas worse than death to teenagers. A middle child's head tilted at a mourner's angle as a tear slowly rolled down her cheek as if to fall on my casket. My youngest held me in a bear hug as if it was the last time ever. My social media conscious 16 year old told me that all responses to the relocation question on Facebook are no, as if I had a choice. The denial, the anger, the acceptance, the exhaustive feeling of having my family watch my own demise. But my support system refused to let the last nail go into the coffin as they put in a crowbar made of emails, phone calls, and leads. I was being resuscitated. How many of you have a will prepared? A will reduces stress and pain. The run through the 
wall question six years earlier had been my I didn't realize how it would prevent my professional passing. My eyes were wide open as I built an extraordinary career-saving and life-changing epic. In Keith Ferrazzi's book, Never Eat Alone, he notes, build it before you need it. Real relationships built over the years provided me meaning and are the reason for my success. I wasn't six feet under. I was six degrees from Kevin Bacon. <laughs> or at least my next big leap. I wasn't flatlined. I was alive and my support system was my CPR. My job loss was a celebration of life, not a funeral. It reminded me how deep my love and appreciation was for my family, friends, and colleagues. I wasn't defined by my job. I defined my own life. I was going to do my funeral my way. No, I'm not going to build out enough. I lost my job, but I found me. I used my displacement as a reaffirmation. And when I leave this earth, I'm leaving with no regrets. Think about your own feelings. When your spirit's hovering over the mourners, did you give them something to mourn about? That didn't come out right. So let's go back to the original question. Have you ever imagined your own funeral? Who will do the eulogy? Who will be your pallbearers? Who will attend or even care? My eulogy was shouted out by the many key people in my network who blew my trumpet with humbling accounts of who I was and have become. My pallbearers carried me when I couldn't go any further. <coughs> Your overwhelming flood of notes and messages <coughs> showed you care. I have to admit, I started writing the speech immediately after I got the call, including the end. We all know we're going to die. <laughs> Not that many. The speech end. The one where I secured a job. It's not overconfident. Just a belief that I'm surrounded by an ironclad network that refused to stop giving me oxygen. Are you ready to see your own funeral? I saw mine. And it was beautiful. My wife gave me an article from Martha Stewart magazine called Stopped Pole. It was an article about how fear keeps you from achieving your goals. Of the poll of readers, more than 90% said that they were held back from achieving their goals because of this fear. If you're fearful of public speaking, is it holding you back from your own success? Can it make the difference between someone wanting to buy your products and services or even being willing to approach you? Confidence takes you an awful long way and impacts potentially your approachability. As you're confident, are you confident enough to have a conversation with a stranger in the street, in an elevator, on a plane? Let's do the opposite. Are you so overconfident that people aren't willing to approach you? Or they're saying, stop overselling me. Effective communication is about building confidence and building relationships. Whether you're talking to hundreds of people <coughs> or one, that is public speaking. But as we mature as public speakers, we go from this very selfish speaker one who's pushing our messages on to, you, to a very selfish speaker, where we're understanding who the audience is and knowing how critical that audience is, all of a sudden turns, if you're in business, to making your customers first. I'm looking for a volunteer. <clears throat> I'm looking for a volunteer. You get a free book. Come on. Bribery always works. Hello, Tiffany. So you just talked to me about your advanced cleaning business. In 30 seconds or less, and by the way, I will stop you. 30 seconds or less, why don't you tell the group about your business? All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Tiffany 
with Advanced Fund Cleaning Services. We are a full-service disaster restoration company dealing with smoke, fire, water, and mold remediation. We also specialize in carpet cleaning. Um, our technicians are trained and certified, and our phone number is 873-1241, and you can also find us on the internet, advance1clean.com.
I personally joined Toastmasters, and there is a Toastmasters group that meets here at Thomas College. It is not for everyone, and it is not a requirement for public speaking. But it does provide you the confidence to be able to do it. The only requirement is to start to take action for yourself. I learned as I joined Toastmasters that I needed to practice a little bit more. So while I would drive to work, it took me 30 minutes to get to work. During radio commercials, about 10 minutes a trip up, 10 minutes a trip back, 20 minutes I was practicing public speaking. Just 20 minutes more than most people do every single day. And then I found a room, I'd go in and practice reading or vocalizing or going over a presentation from work or working on whatever and practicing my communication skills 30 minutes a day, 30 minutes more than most people have. Another thing that you can do is break out of your comfort zone. Be willing to practice in front of your family and friends. <laughs> I join Toast now. But after I joined Toastmasters, it took almost two years before I practiced my first speech in front of my wife. I was on my way out the door to a speech competition in Canada where the winner would go on to the world semifinals and be in the top 81. It seemed like a good time. <laughs> I wrote a seven-minute speech about my dog, Kevin, and rescuing animals. I was so nervous I did the speech in five minutes. There's a line in there that says millions of dogs and cats. I was so tongue-tied. I said millions of dogs and a cat. <laughs> My wife couldn't stop laughing. <laughs> she knew it was a one-time gap and knew the effort I put in to get to this point. I knew if I could do it in front of her, I could do it in front of anyone. My family's been there to, to provide me the feedback I needed to hear and provide me the support to move me forward. My communication skills and confidence level and subsequent success grew exponentially when I involved my family, friends, and colleagues in my learning process. Understand the importance of your support system. Other steps that you can take. Find a mentor. Find a coach. Someone who can specifically work on your communication skills. Become a mentor. When you are mentoring someone else, you become so conscientious and so conscious of what you're doing, you automatically improve your communication skills. Continue to attend events like this, network, social situations, chamber events, and then when you're done, do an evaluation. There were some people that were communicating well. What were they doing well? You don't have to be them, but Try to find some of the skills that are out there, and then go and say, what are some things that you can work on? Did you sit at your table quietly the whole time? Is there an opportunity for you? As every single time you put yourself in an uncomfortable situation, you're chopping a corner off of that anxiety. Little corners at a time. Little corners at a time. Write an elevator speech. What is an elevator speech, anybody? What floor, please? <laughs> An elevator speech is simply you in a nutshell. I want you to write a 30 second, just like the one that was given, a two minute and a five minute version of an elevator speech. You don't think you'll ever need it? A colleague and I were down in Charlotte, North Carolina on business. It was early in the morning. We were working out at the hotel gym. And there was our CEO of 300,000 people. We all had our headset on doing our thing, not a big deal. My colleague and I get on the elevator and in came a hand that stopped the door. We didn't have two minutes, we had two floors. The other thing that you can do is have a notebook or a folder and take stories and blurbs and great things you want to remember that I promise you you won't and just put it in there, let them germinate. These will come in to be very powerful later on, and we'll talk a little bit about it. So now you're ready for action. I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. The more you do it, the more comfortable you're going to be. There is the secret of public speaking, gang. The more you do it, the more comfortable you're going to be. But realize that experienced speakers still get this feeling of anxiety. 
But those who are more experienced have a tendency to do more with it and use it to their advantage. In fact, that anxiety may not even be anxiety. It may be adrenaline in a push to get the message out to people and excitement. Do you remember if you own a business, the first time you opened those doors, that elation that you had, or the first day you started on a job, or the first day you said stop to somebody, all of a sudden, you get this feeling of elation, this excitement. That's today's goal. I want you to have that same feeling every single time you walk up on a stage, a real stage or a virtual stage. And we get there. And we're going to get there when we start to understand the root causes. When you start to understand the root causes, you can figure out why people get this feeling of anxiousness every single time that it's mentioned. So let's talk about the difference between fear and success. This is my 10-year-old daughter getting her ears pierced. This is my 10-year-old daughter, victorious, after getting her ears pierced. All of you can think back to a moment when you found this elation, this victory, this success. That's the goal we want you to walk away with from today. So why do we? If you understand the whys, you can start to figure out the hows. We're out of our comfort zone. We're in a new environment a lot of times. I've had the pleasure of speaking here a couple times, so I'm familiar with the room and the setup. Every single time I've been here, I get more comfortable being here. So you're driving in Chicago. You've never been to Chicago before. You don't have a map. You don't have a GPS. And you take a wrong turn, uh-oh. That's the same feeling you get when you're in a new environment. That anxiousness, that uptight feeling. New equals stressful. But then you also have this risk of failure, or this risk of embarrassment. What if, what if, what if? What if I embarrass myself? What if I fail? What if I'm born? Hi, my name's Tom Dowd, and I'm really excited to be here today. Don't be born. You can come out and say, I'm Tom Dowd. I am really excited to be here today, and I mean it. Because when you are energetic and you feed off of the audience, the audience can feed off of you, all of a sudden that anxiousness kind of goes away. Another reason is this anxiousness, this lack of experience builds up. So in seventh grade, I had to give a presentation at school, a couple minute presentation, I don't even remember what. What I do remember is that my head was spinning completely out of control, and I sat in the wrong seat in the wrong row when I was done. I vowed to never publicly speak again. Let's see how that worked out. And I hoped that it would go away. It doesn't go away. You are surrounded by opportunities for public speaking, whether you want them or not. So instead of hoping I'd never do this, get to a point where you get past the dreaded anticipation and start to get excited about doing it because you can do it because I'm a guy who used to shake uncontrolled. Let's see how I'm doing today. Can't do it. So when I asked for the volunteer to come up in that 30 seconds, and there was silence across the room, how many of you were sitting here and saying, please don't pick me, please don't pick me? <laughs> Your head's spinning, your heart's pounding. Heart's pounding, your shallow breathing. <laughs> please don't pick me. Please don't pick me. Do you realize your professional and business success are contingent on your ability to clearly, concisely, and succinctly convey your thoughts, ideas, and opinion? Even approaching someone if you have a retail store, can I help you with your browsing? Is public speaking. I walked into a store a couple weeks ago and someone was just chatting away behind their laptop. Not even, they didn't even look up when I walked through the door. Do you realize that's public speaking too? Public speaking is not just the words that come out of your mouth. It is how people see you and perceive you. Public speaking is everything. Each time you speak to someone, you are on stage, whether you like it or not. For me, tack on a red face, I'm Irish. Stiff shoulders, upright stance. 
Yep, that was my public speaking persona. <laughs> huh. Guess what? That's normal. It is normal to be anxious. Being conscious of it is half the battle. With all the different symptoms that come on, you're going to have different symptoms as an individual than someone else, and that's okay. But when you know what's coming up, you can do something about it. The red face, remember we were talking about selfish and selfless? I started thinking, well, uh-oh, uh here it comes, here it comes, here it comes. And then, all of a sudden, my message got lost because I wasn't thinking of the audience or the message anymore. I was thinking about me. It's not about me. About you. And when you start to realize that, I don't think about it anymore. I could care less how I look, no offense. <laughs> I care about getting the message across the right way. Use things to your advantage. Well, my legs would shake uncontrollably. Why do you think I came out here in the beginning? It loosened me up. It got a chance to walk around and get the blood moving a little bit. It gave me a chance to see the audience and get a little bit closer and see their eyes. See your eyes. It made me a little bit more comfortable. So how many of you have heard that people would rather die than publicly speak? <laughs> this chart came from dlugan.com when he Googled, die in a blank accident. The death perception isn't real. It's not as bad as you think. And the good news is public speaking didn't even make the death list. <laughs> I feel really bad for those that were thinking about taking that knitting class. <laughs> and I'm sorry for the one blogger. <laughs> grow up with these childhood inhibitions, but we keep being told that I need to fear public speaking worse than death. So we build this anxiousness up as we grow. But you need to be you. I used to try to impress my boss and every single person around me. My true comfort level came when I taught myself to be me. We try to be this overzealous marketer, we try to oversell sometimes. Instead, learning to speak effectively is a matter of relearning who you are and being able to effectively convey that to people. The person you are at the dinner table, when they see you publicly speaking, should be the person they see up on stage. It's very powerful when you play to your strengths and when you just be you. A professional speaker's axiom is you don't have to be funny unless you want to get paid. Now, we're not all aspiring to be professional speakers. Okay, well, maybe. <laughs> Try. However, as business people, we do need to be engaging. We do need to be out there. And humor adds to that. It makes us engaging. It builds up the quality of the presentation. It lightens the mood. It gets people to like you and to like your business. And all of a sudden, that leads to more success out there. And personal stories help. That notebook or folder we were talking about, mine's this thick. When you share personal stories, you start to share messages. And when your messages are there, they start to stick. So I'm going to share an example of a story with you. And the message is the innocence of children. My wife and very naive 14-year-old daughter were driving down the road when my daughter asked what that abandoned building was. My very reluctant wife answered, that's a topless bar. Now before you think I'm about to get inappropriate, my wife said, or excuse me, be, <laughs> I'm going to start over. <laughs> my wife and very naive 14 year old daughter were driving down the road when my daughter asked what that abandoned building was. My very reluctant wife answered, that's a topless bar. Now before you think I'm about to get inappropriate, my daughter, asked, my daughter said, what they do in a rain? <laughs> <laughs> you want me to do it again? <laughs> no! Personal stories anchor the message. You may not remember the message of the innocence of children, but you will remember the topless bar. You'll probably remember I did it twice for you. 
And you'll remember eventually and get back to the innocence of children message. Personal stories anchor your story. We're not looking for comedians, but it is proven that it lightens the mood and it engages the audience out there. But you don't have to be funny. What is important is that you find a connection with the audience. And that comes through conversations. It comes with understanding. It might come with preparation before. I know about who was going to be here today. Gene and I talked about that. The types of people you have to get to know your audience. And while we're here, you ask engaging questions. You ask rhetorical questions, and you start to figure out that connection. Because when you can emotionally connect with an audience, your message is going to stick. So make it go away. You can't. It doesn't go away. But you can control it. And that comes with practice and preparation. Imagine I'm standing in the state of Maine at the finals to win the state championship for a public speaking contest, and I can't remember the first one. I can remember the second one. I had some success in speech competitions, and I was one speech away from the world semifinals, and two minutes in, I repeated the same line. In both cases, I gave the best speech of my life after I made the mistake. Why? Because at that point, I wasn't presenting to the judges. I was simply sharing a message with an audience who feel, felt really bad for me. <laughs> and we found, that's how you get emotional connections, you can mess up. But people were feeling for me. And they were, they were really hoping I would do well, and I fed off of that, and I gave the best presentations of my life, knowing I wasn't going to win, and it simply became about the message. But I didn't realize I had to change my practice routines. I could no longer just drive back and forth to work and memorize my lines. I had to learn to practice and, and prepare. And I needed to be more effective. And by doing that, I learned to give a full-blown dress rehearsal. It's no longer just reciting lines. It became gestures, facial expressions. It became A full-blown dress rehearsal when you practice and prepare. I went from this one-dimensional speaker to a holistic speaker. And you can't wing it. Go back to the times where you tried to wing it. And ask yourself, how successful were you really? You can't wing it. As business people, are you prepared to answer the question of why did you start your business? Why should people care about you and your business? Why do you do what you do? Why should people care? Engaging conversations is opening and inviting, and you can't just wing it. That elevator speech that we heard here today about the cleaning circuit, it's been done before, and it was done extremely well. And we're going to remember that. You're going to run into people on an elevator. You're going to run into people and have to have an impromptu conversation. Impromptu conversations are not impromptu if you do it right. Have your elevator speech ready, have pockets that you can pull out and use these stories. And when you stumble and struggle, go back to that notebook and write those notes down as to why and work on those things. So how can you prepare? Personal styles and how you prepare. I like to write it all the way out and then I cut it down to note cards and then in a lot of cases just let it, let it go and memorize the words that are there. The key is to choose the right words. There are some certain points. I started with the five things I want you to walk away with. I'm going to end with those five things. If there's nothing more I did today, it was to give those five points. You have to ensure the key points and messages you have are noted and ingrained in your head. You need to practice the points of emphasis. There are points that you want to write out. You can write out your cues for nonverbals and for gestures and facial expressions. <laughs> How many people remember this from that movie? What was that from? Home Alone? Everyone remembers the gestures. They are public speaking. Repetition, practice more than once. The average professional speaker I read somewhere, minimum of 20 times practice. Minimum. 
of 2020. Practice in front of a mirror. And as uncomfortable as that just made you sound, it will exponentially improve you. Because every single time you knock a corner of being uncomfortable or anxiety off of that, you're building your confidence. And if you're not comfortable doing it in front of a mirror, good, keep doing it. Friends and family, find that support system. I practice in front of the dog all the time. He howls. <laughs> I've practiced in front of my dental hygienist while in the waiting room. Stage time. Find a stage, full-blown practice. And when you make a mistake, don't stop and go back. Stop and go back. Stop and go back. I took up piano at the tender age of 38. And every time I made a mistake in the beginning, I'd go back and start again. And I kept starting at my beginnings were awesome. But I never got past my mistake, and therefore I didn't learn how to muscle through until my piano teacher said muscle through. And that you learn to go through your mistakes. I made a mistake today, so what? I learned from it. Let's move on. What's important is that you're learning from that. Be familiar with the setting. I got here at 7 o'clock today. I knew the layout of the room because I've been here before, but that didn't matter. I wanted to see. There were tables here, first time tables wherever. So I need to now account, well, this is going to be clanking of silverware while I'm speaking. Where do I want to set up my camera? Am I going to have feedback with this microphone, which I work through? I move the podium up three feet. I have control. And when you have to control the things that you have control of, your anxiety goes down. Shop them off that corner of anxiety one bit at a time. You have control sometimes of lighting, of seating, of the temperature. What you do have control of, take advantage of. Be a student of yourself. Videotape yourself. Again, that, I'm not comfortable doing this. Brand new Toastmasters Club down in Falmouth, and I said, gee, you guys should probably put a video camera out here. Look at yourself. <laughs> the looks on their faces were like, uh uh, no way. Which is a shame. Videotape yourself once and watch yourself, and guess what? You grow exponentially. I spoke down in Massachusetts a couple weeks ago, and by the way, I had some flailing arms going. Nobody told me until I saw the videotape. I might have flailing arms today, but not as much. <laughs> Constantly being a student of yourself. Play with the strengths. Talk, to, talk about stuff that you're familiar with. I'm not going to come in here and talk about rocket science. I'm going to come in and talk to you about the things that I know. Talk about you. Your anxiety is going to go down. And if you don't know anything about it, do your homework. So there are two ways to prepare. There's the mental preparation and physical preparation. You need in the mental side to visualize your own success. Dale Carnegie once said, you can conquer almost any fear if you will only make up your mind to do so. For remember, fear doesn't exist anywhere except in your mind. I love the Winter Olympics. I love when they put the camera on the bobsledders and when they put them on the skiers and they're doing this before they take their run. What are they doing? They're visualizing the course. And they're visualizing the gold medal. They're not visualizing crashing. Visualize your own success. I was convinced I could win the world championship of public speaking. And then I met Joe in the gym in the morning. By the way, I'm going to stop going to the gym. Because Joe, I said, Joe, you don't know me, I'm Tom Dow. I saw you six months ago. And you were at the conference, and all the things that you taught, I learned so much from you. I brought it in the, into the speech I'm going to give tonight at the competition. And he said, oh, that's fantastic. I'm so excited for you. I said, Joe, are you competing tonight? He said, yeah. I said, oh. <laughs> I said, Joe, are you a public speaker, a uh, professional speaker? He said, yeah. I said, oh. I saw a guy a little bit later before the competition. We're all together. And he said, gee, I really hope I win the world championship of public speaking so I can quit my day job. I said, that's funny. He said, no, really. I said, are you a professional speaker? He said, yes. I said, oh. My confidence was shocked. Put yourself into a position to build up your confidence. Put yourself in a position to psych yourself up. Put yourself in a position 
for success. And part of that comes with knowing the audience. Do you know who you're speaking to? You can't just randomly shove your message down on somebody's throat know who your audience is. How are you going to relate to them? How is your message going to resonate with them? You must believe the audience is here to see you. Believe. Capitalized on my notes. And understand that fear may not be this anxiety. It may be an excitement to get the message out to people. The other piece is have a message that people would want to hear. Because that's mental, your head's spinning. All of that leads to your physical of sweating and shaking. So do a little bit of physical preparation. Everyone together, breathe in deep. Breathe out. When I was being introduced, I did a little bit of this. Get the muscles relaxed a little bit, get the Blood flowing a little bit, reduce the stiffness. If you get a chance to exercise before, do it. Get the blood flowing. You want to be able to take the physical and mental and put them together. The last thing I'll leave you with in the preparation part is to stick to your routine. Don't all of a sudden do something special the day you're speaking. I'm not going to sit here and have a huge bacon breakfast and fill up my stomach before coming up here because my routine is a Diet Coke and a granola bar. That's what I had for breakfast. I listen to the same music I like to listen to. And you put yourself at ease, chopping off the little corners of anxiety. People are here to listen to you. You've got to believe that you can impact the audience. They don't want you to fail. I hope you don't want me to fail. I hope you're here because you want to walk away with something. For anyone who is required to be here today, shh, I don't need to know. <laughs> you truly know that you've made it. When at the end of the presentation, I don't say, how did I do today? I say to you, were you able to walk away with something? And that's the difference of going from this selfish speaker to a selfless speaker. And that's what's important. You have to understand that anxiety is completely normal. It will never go away completely, but use it to your advantage. Intensify your emotions if you need to. But understand that it is normal. In a very stressful speech competition moment, I ran into Joe again. And I said, Joe, how do you relax? And he said, I live in the present. Because you will never get this moment again to stand up on this stage in front of this audience and share your message, and they get to share with you. So I will say to you, live in the present as you progress from fear to success. I hope that you notice as we went through today, there were a variety of ways to present, and each one of them have their own success. I did it out in front, I did it off the notes, I did it with slides. Each one of these have their own strengths and opportunities to attach to them. You just have to figure out what's going to work best for you. For the last part of the presentation, I will go out front, and I'm going to give one more speech for you, and then we're going to wrap up with time with a couple of question and answer pieces of the session. I am available to chat after. Feel free to take a look at my stuff under transformationcom.com. My books are on Amazon under eBooks um, and also paperback, and I'll be glad to talk to you after. But what's important for you to walk away with today is that public speaking is more about confidence and communication. Public speaking is more than a lecture, a podium, a microphone. You are surrounded by it. Your ability to learn to publicly speak is not as hard as you think. The hardest part is taking the first steps. Public speaking is about refining and honing those skills, a learned skill regardless of your experience level. And finally, your success is contingent on your ability to speak publicly. I'm going to end with a speech that has meant an awful lot to me. And it's boosted by confidence. Time and time again. I was 15 years old. My buddy Jack slept over. He <coughs> had a coughing fit for hours. It was deep, constant, breathless. My parents were at home. I was scared to death. Jack, wake up! Oh, uh, what? Oh, man. You don't wake a guy drinking a Jody. Dude. Jody. How are you? All right? 
He really, he had never told me. You see, ladies and gentlemen, Jack had cystic fibrosis. According to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, more than 70,000 people worldwide are affected by this chronic disease that often cuts life short. The main symptom is a thick, sticky mucus. How would you live your life if you knew you had an expiration date? Jack knew he wouldn't make it past the age of 25. I saw the look on my face. It was just shock, pity, and helplessness. But he told me not to worry. Because it's not about dying. It's about living. Jack was four foot eleven with a five foot smile. He lived this life the way that we all should. Like we are dying. I never saw him sad, angry, or remorseful. He carried the potential burden of an early death like it was a pocket full of change. You never knew it was there. Until you heard the jingle. Or in his case. Through high school, Jack was an active student with a zest for life, but unable to participate in sports. He took great joy in being behind the hand. He would often hand his hand to shots of power playing and would simply say, live life. He also wasn't afraid of being on the other side of the camera, where he always jumped in front of yearbook pictures screaming, isn't life great? He often introduced himself as Hank. There was no particular reason, except it was amusing. Jack went to Wagner University because there was too much of life to live and learn. I went to see him my freshman year. We were stopped by Hinchy Campus policeman as we were walking down the street. We were laughing too hard. He said, You're drunk. Soon to be disorderly. No, just living a good life. Still suspicious, he said. Don't ever come back again. I told Jack I would die if my parents ever found out. He laughed. He said, it's not about dying. It's about living. Jack had to leave college after a couple of years. Too many extended trips to the hospital. While many of us were waiting for our first legal beer, Jack, was hooked up to tubes planning his own funeral. Still, the signature smile never left. He never wanted pity, but he did like a good laugh. Even on the day his casket rolled up the church aisle. He had the Rolling Stones song, You Can't Always Get What You Want, Plan. He laughed and cried simultaneously for the first time ever. It was a problem. I'm just handed it. A lesson in life at the tender age of 21. I didn't. Somehow I let the speed of life over the next 20 years pass me by. There's nothing wrong with my life, just the daily grind. In a hustle and bustle airport one day, I heard a faint noise. A cough, deep, constant, breathless, like Jack's. I then heard the song I heard a hundred times since his dad. I heard it for the first time. A lot of repressed memories came back. I grabbed the old yearbook when I got home. Dear Tom, many things have happened between us. You don't know how scared I was that we would never talk again. After I asked Jody to the prom, thanks for not getting mad. Four foot eleven. And he always got the girl. I'm really glad we got to spend a lot of time together over the past couple of years. Well, I will end this. Not with goodbye or good luck, but with remember to live life. Jack. You can't always. You don't want me singing. <laughs> you can't always get what you want. But if you try sometimes, you find you get what you need. I need it, Jack. Even 20 years later. He lived his life to the fullest, and I had. Wasted time. We can all live our life to the fullest. We can all do that. I went out, learned how to play the piano, took out fly fishing, and although terrified of heights, went up in a hot air balloon. I even wrote a book about my own transformation. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we all know we're going to die. And tomorrow is a promise to any of us. So let's make today our day. Let's start with it. Let me begin by introducing myself. 